What's going on everyone? Welcome to Movie Emporium's TV review of Severance Season 1 Episode 7, which is called Defiant Jazz. This once again is directed by Ben Stiller. Now before we begin, if you like this channel, awesome, hit the subscribe button to enjoy Movie Emporium, hit that notification bell top to find coming next. If you like this video, awesome, hit that like button as well as commenting below on any video that you watch, including this one. Okay, so... <laughs> We talked about Severance, or at least I talked about it in my first five episode review, that Severance is a horror show. And what I mean by that is you have individuals who have decided that they're going to do this procedure. And this procedure involves them losing half, like, half their life to a different personality or a different person that doesn't remember the other half and vice versa. That's a really scary thing to think about, especially when the any part, the any section... Um, doesn't know what their outside life is like. And it's the same thing, you know, wrapped around the other side where the outside doesn't know what the inside is like. And when those two start to converge and you realize, especially if you're the any part, that you have children and you want to know their names and certain people will not tell you that, it's probably going to set you off. It's probably going to make the world around you completely collapse. And that is exactly what happens in this episode. This episode is a lot of moving pieces and moving parts on the chessboard that basically pretty much start blowing this whole situation that was just a normal day at the work. What are they doing? Who cares? They're just there to work, make money. And now it's become a whole fiasco that involves death, that involves corruption, that involves people hiding things from people. But yeah, this episode is absolutely disturbing. It really is. It's depressing. It's uncomfortable to watch. But it's absolutely riveting storytelling. It's absolutely necessary storytelling. It's an episode literally becomes so integral and important to the uh, how overall kind of concluding narrative to this series. Because we only have like two more episodes left. That it almost feels like this is a mini series at this point. That there will not be a second season because of what has actually is happening in this episode. But I absolutely love this episode. I mean... It's one of the best of the series so far. It's an episode that has a lot to do and a lot to say. It deals with some really interesting kind of uh, revelations on what exactly is happening. And give, has a bunch of performances that are absolutely uh, heartbreaking, but also just completely riveting to watch. It really is. It's that type of episode. And it pretty much starts out with, like, you know, the stuff that happened in the last week. For instance, we have Mark with this doctor lady that we don't even know her name. We find out that she was part of helping get procedures done for the severance package for people like Mark. And she also helped PD kind of reintegrate, I guess you could say, but he didn't follow the procedures, like the, the post-op procedures. So that's why it, what happened to him, what happened to him. And it's a really interesting conversation. Like she doesn't really give a lot out. She doesn't give too much out, but they're in the school they walk into this room and all of a sudden Grainier pops up and he's questioning why Mark's in the school. Who is he talking to someone? And then he gets beaten to death with a baseball bat. I'm like, Oh boy. Um, this is going places. Uh, this is really dark and disturbing, but it's kind of important. It's actually a little bit of a, a necessity for him to die, to be fairly honest, especially what we learned that uh, Lumen is doing to the, their department, the uh, M M M MRD or whatever it's called. The reason for his death is so Mark can get the uh, security access card. And as we know, in the last episode, they put on a security access door to basically not allow them to leave. They're kind of prisoners in their own job now, which is illegal, to be fairly honest. But Lumen is a very different company, so le uh, legality is a very weird concept for this company. But in essence, Mark is given the key card to this lady. She tells her to get rid. She tells him to get rid of all his clothes so that they can't trace it back to the death of Grainier. And I'm like, this episode has already started out really crazily and disturbing, and I love it. I love everything that's happening so far. But it basically leads to Mark going back home to his house, getting rid of all his clothes. Alexa, who he's completely forgotten about, to be fairly honest, has walked in, you know, because they slept together. She asked him where he's at, why he's been gone for an hour. He says he needs to, he's, it's been a while since he's done something like this. And then she asks the important question, do you want me to stay? And he's like, oh, I think you should probably leave. I understand the stress that he's in, but that's kind of the fall down for, for an individual wanting to date another individual. It's like, maybe you should stay. Maybe you can comfort, you know, Mark or whatever, but Mark isn't having any of it. It's basically the end of the, at this point, probably the end of the relationship for Alex, Alexa and uh, Mark's character. But, you know, she leaves and Mark, of course, 
uh, he he wakes up and throws his stuff in the garbage and whatnot. And Kobo comes out, of course, of her house. She's wearing her, you know, outfit that she wore when she visited uh, Devin. And, you know, she makes some, she's very nosy, but she's doing it on purpose. And she makes some comments about, like, detergent or whatever it is. And Mark goes to work, goes to work, and she goes off to talk to Devin in the episode. But it, it basically leads, we'll, we'll get that out of the way. She goes and she talks to Devin Cobalt. Uh, she talks about how latching onto the baby. It makes some funny jokes and comments about, you know, this woman in an airport that had trouble. And then, of course, uh, Devin brings up uh, Gabriel. She found out that, Gabe, you know, she tells Cobalt about Gabriel and stuff like that. And, you know... Doing what Kobol does, who's a very sneaky individual, she's like, why would he do severance? And Devin talks about how he did it after his wife's death, which makes a lot of sense. He wants to, you know, find something that's meaningless and kind of get away and not have to worry about, you know, his wife half the time when he works. And I found that kind of compelling, to be fairly honest. I thought it was an interesting kind of story because I think Kobol knows exactly why he did it, but she's trying to play a different character. To kind of keep uh, out of the process of you know her snooping what she what she's doing I don't know exactly I don't exactly know but I know she's kind of in, infiltrating herself into Mark's sister which is a really interesting concept but that's pretty much where Devin's character is led she's just kind of there as a kind of give some information to of course Kobol but we'll kind of switch back over to the main story uh, Milicek is checking the door before the the four individuals come into work uh, he's checking the security door pushing the thing in and out to the key card just to make sure that it works uh, I wonder if he has like OCD problems because he's like very dressed very well he looks very clean so maybe he's very uh, he, like I said has a lot of OCD problems I guess you could say and what starts to happen is once each individual, you know, Dylan, Irving, Haley, and of course Mark come in, he escorts them each to the room because of course they don't have, a, well, they supposedly don't have a security key card. Actually, Mark actually puts the security key card back in his pocket when he goes up to, you know, Severance or to Lumen. And uh, they are brought into the room. And of course, uh, Dylan, who we, you know, learn that, you know, he's brought out of his whatever stasis of Severance. He starts asking questions to Milicek, and Milicek won't answer him really that much. He tells him it's called the overtime contingency, that they can actually bring people out of the severance thing into the Audi world to get it, garner information or something like that. And I thought that was really interesting. He, asked, he actually asked about his kid, and Milicek's like, you might just want to leave it alone. Don't really want to get this to Kobol's information and stuff like that. And this is important because this is a turning point for Dylan's character. Like I said, he is an individual that is dealing with some real trauma now, some PTSD trauma with having the simple fact of, imagine if you were to get off, get onto an elevator, and you forgot everything you were doing beforehand, and you're a different person. And then you're snapped back into a location that you have no idea where you're at. That could really mess you up mentally. And it does. Dylan is a completely different person in this episode. He's changed. He's not just a background character. He's an individual that is going to change the course of this whole episode with the help of all the, the three other individuals. Now, we don't see Haley or Irving come into the room, but we see uh, Mark, like I said, he put the, the key card, the security key card into his pocket, and he goes up the elevator, and that's when, of course, he's met by Milicek, who escorts him. And, uh, of course, Mark is really strange, and he's weirded out by this, but... He's brought into the, the research room, and, of course, he is given a cup of coffee. He's told that he's not going to be brought to the break room, which, uh, you know, as we can tell, Mark is very scared by the break room at this point because, if you remember, his knuckles were all bruised and, you know, bruised and stuff like that. But then they start working, and at some point, Irving comes to Mark and is like, why don't the soap dispensers have labels on them? And Dylan's like, because it's soap. And he's like, oh, we should go talk to the O&D department. And Mark brings up the whole idea of just how bad of an idea that is and so on and so forth. And so Milicek walks into the room, okay? You know, whatever. He's rolling in a cart. And, of course, everybody knows that somebody he has been given a MED, a musical interlude or whatever. It's because somebody got 75% on whatever they're doing, the whatever the 
you know, it's never been fully explained what their actual job is, which is, uh, there's a reason to that, I guess. It's supposed to be secretive and stuff like that. And it's Hilly, who, for some reason, has only gotten 73%, but Milicek has, like, disregarded that, because I think he's trying to bring everything under control, trying to bring everyone under control. But Dylan is just not having any of it. He just kind of sits there on his computer going into his work and stuff like that. And then Milicek plugs in the uh, the device. It's a record player. She asks, uh, Hilly asks for Defiant Jazz, which is really funny, because it's like um this is an episode about defiance and she picks an, uh, a record called defiant jazz which i thought was kind of interesting and in essence what ends up happening is they start you know you see if you've seen the trailer you've seen it they start dancing milichek starts dancing and probably one of the most amazing things way the amazing ways possible i've ever seen you know as somebody dancing he just the guy has moves it's really kind of awesome and then of course hilly is able to pick out an instrument and she's like rattling the instruments stuff like that she's dancing and milichek's dancing with her milichek is dancing with everyone mark starts dancing Irving starts dancing and, you know it's just a a really weird kind of uh mamba or samba or whatever you want to call it and I thought it was fun I thought it was entertaining but it starts to get darker and darker and darker in the essence of like the mood when he starts dancing around uh Dylan who's just working on his computer he's he's frustrated he's angry about the whole situation at hand and he doesn't really respond but you see the kind of like if you ever seen uh, anger in Inside Out, the the fire starting to slowly turn to like like maximum, and it gets to a point where Dylan actually attacks Milicek, like throws him into the record player, falls on him the ground. And he's like, "I want to know the name of the kid. I want to know the name of my son." And then he bites Milicek in the arm, like it actually bites him and breaks the skin, which is crazy. And I thought that was awesome because Dylan's a character that you enjoy but he's always been kind of in the background and here's a moment where dylan just kind of loses control and that's not something that's supposed to happen at lumen but in essence he basically tells uh milchek tells dylan i think we should go see cobalt and uh dylan's like are you sure you want to do that we can tell her what happened and that's when milchek kind of leaves and just kind of walks off but it leads to them starting to talk about because during the during the uh dance the music the music and the dance stuff like that mark finds the key card in his pocket and he pulls out he realizes that's granier's card when uh, milichek leaves and they start having discussion about what exactly happened and you know dylan tells about the you know overtime contingency plan and talks about how he saw his son and he can't find his son's he doesn't know his son's name and that's when we get into the horrifying nature of severance because if you think about it this this guy has a kid his Audi personality the one that got hired for the job has a kid and he's never going to know this kid's name he's never going to know who this kid is never going to be able to grow up with this kid what raise him stuff like that and it brings up the idea of what happens when you retire which becomes an important part of this episode the idea of knowing that when your Audi retires your any completely is dissolved it disappears it's gone it's like you know possible it's basically death for an individual and there's a lot of stuff brought up about how people were brought into this world uh, into this in any program as infants and it's talked about this to mark from the the doctor lady thing you know he's she's telling him she's like just think about if you if you were to give person a life you're giving this other half life and then you're not allowing this life the other half to have any kind of semblance of reality they're living in a workspace they have no idea what they're doing. It, it brings up the problems of control and the problems of what it is like to control somebody that you don't know anything about. And that's exactly what, what's happening here. The, the overtime contingency is a emergency plan that is only used in emergency situations. And the whole card thing, the whole uh, card that is given is that uh, Dylan takes seems so minuscule, but they make it so important. So what exactly does that card mean? But from the time that Mark, of course, uh, by the time that Dylan has bit Milchek, that's when things start to kind of completely collapse on this whole situation. They decide that they're going to find the security room and learn about this contingency program. They're going to see what, you know, of course, Granier has disappeared. Why do they have, why does Mark have Granier's card? Nobody knows. And they decide, like I said, they're going to find the security room and figure out what exactly this, over, this overtime program is. And Dylan stays behind. And, of course, Irving and Hilly and Mark leave with the security card. They're able to open the door. Irving decides he's going to visit Bert because 
this is a relationship that is really kind of messed up in a lot of ways because they don't know each other outside of the work. They know each other inside of work. So he's going to go see him because this is the only time he's able to see him. And the fact they've been locked into a room, into a prison cell, really affects Irving's character in the series. Like, it's really crazy. These two characters, Dylan and Irving, get some really hard-hitting moments in this series. And But we'll talk about what happens with Irving in just, just a couple minutes. But in essence... Hilly and Mark go to the security room. It takes a few minutes, but they go there. They find the security room. They open it. And what they see is a bunch of monitors. But what they really see is what I was talking about in the last you know, last episode review is this like control board. It looks like something out of a power plant in a lot of respects. And they find their names and they find the security contingency book that would talk about, you know, the overtime contingency. But we kind of see how this whole thing works. It's a dial system. You can implement a computer and you can turn off the whole severance package and stuff like that. But before they can investigate anything further, Cobalt is of course coming to work. And so they kind of leave the room and go back to where they, uh, where they work at. But I think it's really interesting. I think it's a really fascinating concept and very simple concept that this whole idea of severance is basically a computer system that's very old in its own right like everything is retro in this show so like the computers are retro the tvs are retro the music's retro it's almost like this world is trying to live in a is living in a day and age where everything is very ahead of its time and very futuristic but it also feels very being john malkovich where everything feels old and outdated and it feels like very simplified i guess you could say a lot of aspects and that's what i really love about the show is the ability to do futuristic type things in a very retro like setting which is very hard to do and very hard to pull off but when it works it actually truly works very very well do you want to talk there is one moment with cobalt which i thought was kind of interesting so cobalt has come back from work she's done her thing with whatever she's done with Devin and natalie who's her i think her secretary in essence maybe i don't know she comes running out of the office and says the board wants to meet with her that Grainier is dead. And this leads into they want to know what exactly is going on. And it leads to a really interesting moment with Cobalt where she basically tells the board in Natalie's ear, to be fairly honest, which I thought was kind of interesting, that she has some information that she wants. To, she will not say anything. She'll, she talks to him in person. You can hear the muffling of the board members. So who the board members are is really interesting. I, I, I'm i assuming we're going to find out. Maybe it's Egan or something like that. Um, but I thought it was a really kind of interesting moment. And they agree. They say they're going to do it on Egan's day or whatever, some celebration day that probably involves like hot dogs and hamburgers or watermelon or something you know because they have a lot they eat a lot of fruit in this up in this series which i thought was kind of funny but yeah it's really interesting that she actually uh pushes back because there's a lot of people that talk about how she's part of the egan call which she kind of is but she pushes back on this whole situation and they're going to meet with her and i'm really interested to see how it's going to play out but that's pretty much where Cobalt, uh, Patricia Arquette's character, leaves off in this episode. But I thought it was a like a really great moment for her character. It's really dark and sinister, and everything she's been involved with. Maybe she's trying to um, uh, uproot the company. Maybe trying to become the head of the company. It's really kind of remains to be seen. But uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of an inter interesting little piece that they put in there to kind of progress her story forward. So Irving goes, of course, to see Bert. And earlier in the episode, Milchik actually visits Bert, who's working on a painting. Uh, he looks at it, he says it's really cool, really nice looking, really done, well done. And then he says he has something really special for Bert. And um, that's when, you know, Bert's like, okay, cool, whatever. And then Bert, and that's when Irving walks into the O&D department and they're having a party of some sort, a very, very simplified party of just watermelon fruits and vegetables and stuff like that and as milchek is talking he notices irving over there and he's like oh i'm gonna write down a note just to make sure they've had the door fixed because you shouldn't be in here the thing that happens that sets off irving and it's really sad and depressing is irving go was going to visit bert but bert is showing a video which is the um exit interview or retirement interview for the outside version of bert now there's a lot of Theories that you could think about with this whole situation is Bert being coaxed into retiring. Was he fired? Was he what, what? What exactly happened? Because it's really weird that the minute all this stuff starts happening with Dylan, you know, and Irving, and of course Bert, and Bert's all of a sudden retiring, and he didn't ever seem like he wanted to retire. 
you start to question what exactly is up with Lumen, to be fairly honest. And Bert talks about how he, you know, he doesn't know any of these people, but he's happy. Is still some kind of, you know, value to them and so on and so forth because of the severance thing. You know, everybody he leaves doesn't remember them working with each other. And he wishes them well. And he, you know, is excited for retirement. And at the end of this, you know, when Milicek is like, you know, shaking Bert's hand, this sets off Irving, who absolutely eviscerates Milicek with words. It is powerful stuff to be fairly honest it is you're a piece of ass you're an mf -er, you're manipulating everyone it's just a really kind of strong-willed point for an individual that really is very committed to his job and never really questions anything and now that we've had all this stuff open up with Burt and Irving and Irving seeing kind of the dark side with Dylan and just everything that's starting to happen, we're starting to see a world where it is showing to them how truly terrifying it is that once Burt leaves, he's never going to come back and he's never going to remember uh, Irving's character. And that's terrifying to Irving because he has a love for this guy. He loves this guy. It's, you know, almost like a soulmate in a lot of respects. And just the idea and concept of having to live the rest of your life never seeing this guy again or never seeing this person again, I understand why Irving got set off. I understand why he said what he said. He, he said some things that are really truthful. And I think this is starting to upset the, the whole ordeal or whole, whole idea of Severance in you know, his nutshell. And it's starting, starting to show the cracks and, you know, concepts and problems with this whole idea of, you know, splitting your brain into two, basically. And Milchek just goes, I don't understand what's going on with everyone today, but we are going to have, a, we're going to fix this problem. And he takes, uh, and they start playing some, uh, I can't remember what the song is, but it's like a really good song to fit the episode. And Milchek takes uh, uh, Irving back to his office and Irving has the greatest line ever. He's like, we're going to burn this effort to the ground or burn this build company to the ground because he's finally just tired of all this crap. And I love how this kind of, the seed was kind of planted because of what Hilly did because of the, how messed up this whole situation is and how messed up, you know, Lumen is and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a really kind of interesting way to play out an episode. And then it leads to Mark who's sitting at home drinking, I think, scotch or rum or whatever he's drinking. And Alexa shows up because she forgot her phone. And basically, I think this is the end for their relationship. But, you know, we still have two more episodes, so who knows? Mark is really drunk. He is really just kind of being uh, an idiot, I guess you could say. He's really upset. The whole idea of losing his wife, the whole idea of what happened with Grainier and PD. She, he can't tell her any of this stuff, which is a pro, which is kind of, kind of sucks. And... The way he acts, the fact that he's really drunk, it kind of puts her off, and she just kind of leaves. And he even rips up a photo of his, his wife, and you can tell that he was struggling to do that. But the relationship that Alexa was wanting, it, it has nothing to do with his wife. It has everything to do with just who Mark is as an individual that is a sweet, gentle guy, and he kind of just kind of ruins the relationship. Because he thinks that it's all about his wife. And Alexa doesn't care that he talks about his wife because it's an important thing for his life. You know, the whole situation of losing your wife in the most dramatic way possible. She's not trying to replace that. She's just trying to f have him find him, basically, or give him a happy place, I guess you could say. And I, she never cared about that, but he made it to the point where she's just like, you need to look into yourself and figure yourself out. And it gets to a point where she just leaves, and I think she just breaks up with him, and I don't think he understands that. But he goes back in the house and basically tapes back up the photo because it's important to him. And that's when he, that's when the, before the episode ends, there's a voiceover of him talking about his wife. And it really comes down to the thing, the reason he's crying in the beginning of the series, everything that's happening to him, a, like a, a mechanism, it's a, a way for him to try and cope, but he's so distraught by it that everything that he does and will do after her death is affected by her death, which is understandable. And, but he made the poor decision of going to Lumen and, you know, taking severance to kind of, try to keep himself you know away from that world and it is a really sad moment for a character that you really feel for a lot because he's a character that was a pretty good employee but when he's put in the situation it, it kind of collapses upon him and he's especially in his in, inside self and everyone else is just they're getting tired of this whole situation so and with that said that's the episode in a nutshell that's the episode in its full entirety it's an episode that really has some dark messages really hits home and is very difficult in its own right to watch but is an episode that is really important it has a lot of stuff to say 
about corporate work life, about how we try to hide our emotions, how they get the better of us, how it ruins people around us, and how things that we try to do and things that we want to believe are a lot of times controlled by certain other things, other spectrums, other worlds. And to have a company like this that can control half your life and there's nothing you can do about it, especially like what Hilly has to go through. It's really hard. It really is. It's really crazy, this episode and what it did and how it presented itself. And But I struggled talking about this episode a little bit because it really just kind of sits with you. You know, I could literally probably think about this episode for like a week and just kind of mull over exactly what it's doing. And that's what Severance is so great about is just the, the way it kind of ekes into your mind and your brain and your heart and your soul. And just makes you realize that there are things that you're doing that you're that in your life that are being, being controlled. And that's a very scary thought to think about. And it seems like you want to try and get out, but it's always, you know, for instance, your job. Maybe you don't like your job, but you feel like you have no way out and no way forward. And it's just, it's a very scary thing to think about, especially, like I said earlier, when they actually will not let you leave. You have no it's like when in the matrix talking about free will you have no free will in this it's your know, your soul is given to this company and it's crazy i mean i'm gonna give the episode you know for my score a 10 out of 10 because it's just an absolutely riveting episode but it is one that you think about as you watch it and i i can't believe that this show is just so effective even seven episodes later there's never been a dip of quality like i said the last episode i gave it nine and a half out of ten but that was for some some like smaller reasons but for the most part it's been so consistent in its storytelling that it just it completely just doesn't leave you even after you know a few weeks and i'll be thinking about this episode series if it's only a mini series i'll be thinking about the series forever and just how good it was and there's other series i've reviewed which i don't really think about after i review it you know it kind of it just kind of goes away but this series is special it really is and it's gonna it really i just can't wait for the next two episodes so yeah, yeah, 10 out of 10. I think this is a perfect episode. So, anyways, uh, that'll do it. That'll be my take on Severance Season 1, Episode 7, which is called Defiant Jazz. In the comments below, what did you think of the episode? Are you uh, on board still like I am? Did you think this was a great episode? What is your overall feeling on just where this episode is? It kind of went, I guess you could say. Let me know in the comments. But otherwise, if you like what you see on this channel, hit the subscribe button to join Movie Emporium. Hit that notification bell at the top to find what's coming next. If you like this video, Awesome. Hit that like button. And as always, we'll see you guys on the next video. Peace out.